Hi, Suri. Uh, hello, Vimon. Long time. Yes. How are you? <laughs> nice. So, as fine as can be, no? <laughs> yes. Oh. I know. What about you? What new? Uh, as you said, you know. Any new books? <laughs> Popular books? Uh, some, uh, yeah, in the pipeline coming out. Um, because of the pandemic, you know, they were a bit slow in rolling out some of the publishers. But... I see. Wonderful. So, Joy, you will be able to take care of the chair. Yeah, yeah. I'm just waiting, Suri, because there are yeah. around 28 people here. Maybe I'll just wait for one or two more minutes. Yeah, three, four minutes we can wait, I think. Mm -hmm. That's what we break anyway after that. So, yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. So, maybe just bear with me. Professor Nath, do excuse us. We are uh, just delaying for uh, no uh, getting more, more people to join. No problem at all. Yeah. And it's uh, supposed to be for uh, more than an hour. I'll take probably about an hour and then we'll leave a yeah, few yeah. minutes for that's Akish. Great. We'll have some time to interact with the, yes. uh, with the questions. Yes. And, yeah. Maybe we'll slowly start and uh, yeah. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to the second session of the Resonance Lecture Series, um, celebrating the 25th anniversary of uh, the journal Resonance of the Indian Academy of Sciences. Uh, today in the afternoon session, we have two talks by uh, Professor Biman Nath and Professor Jay Kumar Radhakrishnan of TIFR. And to chair the session, I would like to invite uh, Professor Arvind Ayer from ISC Bangalore, 
Professor Ayer is from the Department of Mathematics, a professor at the Department of Mathematics and also associated professor of uh, the Department of Physics at the Indian Institute of Science. And he primarily works on probability theory, mathematical physics. So interests in both, um, uh, both physics and mathematics and very intriguingly uh, experimental mathematics. So uh, it's a pleasure to have you Professor Ayer to chair the session. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Mitra, for the kind introduction. Okay, so we have two very exciting talks. Uh, the, our first speaker is Professor Biman Nath from RRI. Let me give you a quick uh, introduction. So Professor Nath uh, obtained his PhD in astrophysics from University of Maryland in 92. Uh, he was then a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute in Bonn and at the Ayuka in Pune. He, he joined RRI in 97 has, and has been there ever since. He has held visiting positions at the Max Planck Institute uh, in Bonn as a, a Humboldt Fellow uh, at the University of Oxford and at the University of Colorado in Pune. Uh, he has also received the Indira Gandhi Award for Science Popularization from the Indian National Science Academy uh, he works on various aspects of diffuse matter in the universe. Uh, so he has also been an editor for Resonance at some point. Uh, so over to you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Ayer. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the organizers for this, uh, the kind of invitation to speak on this uh, um, celebration of 25 years of resonance. It's uh, it's an honor and a privilege. And uh, so let me share my screen then. And um, I've chosen to talk about, uh, let's see, to talk about our sun as a star. Uh, can you see the screen, Professor? Uh, yes, sorry. yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, we know that our sun is a star. Uh, it's the nearest star. Uh, we are taught this uh, uh, in school books uh, from early on. Uh, what I want to do is to dig a little bit deeper into this rather simple statement that the sun is a star, because uh, I want to show that it's not a simple, uh, as simple as it may seem. Uh, it has taken years, I mean, centuries, in fact, millennia, to come to this conclusion. Um, and my purpose is to show that sometimes asking simple questions can lead to interesting thoughts, uh, sometimes which we often uh, set aside while going through the curriculum in schools. The point is this, um, ah, the point is this. So we see sun in the daytime and we see stars at night. I'm asking this question, what made us put in, on an equal footing when in the history of science um, did this happen or did the scientists come to be sure that the you know, sun is a star? Uh, uh, that the sun and the stars that we see at night are similar uh, uh, in physical properties. Now it's clear that ancient people didn't know this uh, Greeks didn't know this. For example, in their geocentric model of the universe, where the Earth is at the center, and so Sun and the, uh, some other objects, they were very different from what the Greeks call the fixed stars. So this is the fixed stars, and uh, so this is their model of the, the universe. Uh, they, you can see the Moon, Mercury, Venus, and the, the Sun, and it what they call the eighth heaven. They were called the fixed stars. So the stars were imagined to be fixed in the, uh, like uh, painted on the walls, like some of the wallpaper far out somewhere in the universe. The distance didn't really matter. They were all at some very large distance. Uh, of course, uh, fixed in the sense that, you know, uh, of course the stars also uh, rise in the east and the set in the west, just like the sun uh, does. Uh, but that's because of Earth's rotation around the, uh, its axis. That's not the movement we are talking about. If you look at the pattern of the stars, that remains fixed, irrespective of 
when you see them. But the other objects, sun, moon, and the planets, they move, they seem to move in the background of these fixed stars. So that's the movement we are talking about. And sun and the moon, they were grouped along with the planets which uh, moved in the sky, right? So, uh, so this is uh, the, uh, the Greeks idea. Copernicus changed it all. He put the sun in the center of the universe. Uh, this is the sun and then the, the planets and the uh, moon rotated, uh, revolved around the earth. But the fixed stars remained very far out uh, they painted on some uh, like the wallpaper far out in the universe. And in fact, uh, Copernicus in his book, when he talks about the sun with respect to the stars, his statements are very lyrical, very poetic. Uh, uh, he says in the, let me see if I can, this one. Uh, in the center of all rests the sun, for who would place this lamp of a very beautiful temple in another? Or better place than this, where from it can illuminate everything at the same time. Okay, that's the sort of statements that he makes uh, for the sun. Uh, Kepler, then came Kepler, who found the laws of planetary motions, uh, which we learn in the school. Uh, even his statements regarding the sun and the stars were tinged with religious sentiments, I should say. Uh, he called the sun God's home, and then to satisfy the uh, idea of uh, the doctrine of Trinity in Christianity, he put uh, Jesus' home, sun's God, uh, God's sun home at the fixed stars, and the Holy Ghost in the cosmic ether. Now, these are hardly scientific statements. Only Giordano Bruno, only Giordano Bruno, uh, this is the end of 16th century, he suggested that uh, some of the fixed stars, not, maybe not all, were like a sun. Uh, and he suggested that those stars may also have planets around them. And this is a revolutionary idea, but this is not a scientific statement. There is no scientific argument. This is mere speculation for which he was of course uh, persecuted. Uh, you might think that Newton may have thought scientifically about the sun, but that's not so. Uh, in the book, uh, uh, Principia, uh, that he wrote, in the in a very later edition, 1729th edition, he puts a footnote, not in the first editions. He puts a footnote where he criticizes the idolaters of the past who supposed the sun, the moon, and stars to be parts of the supreme god and therefore to be worshipped because he says the creator was omnipresent and the light of the fixed stars is of the same nature as the light of the sun and all the systems send light into all the other systems again it's not very clear what he's trying to say here uh, and i suspect uh, uh, one can ask why did he put it in the footnote and that also in the later editions i suspect that he was uh, in, impressed by an experiment that was done by the Dutch uh, scientist Christian Huygens in 1689. This is after the first edition of Principia, by the way, and which he describes very briefly uh, in his book, Cosmotheos. And this is a very interesting experiment that Huygens did, but I'm not to the, uh, uh, to be frank, I'm, I'm not very sure of how he did this experiment because there's no experimental setup and the descriptions are very, very terse. What it does is to, what he did is to compare the brightness of the sun with the Sirius. Sirius is, as you know, the brightest star in the sky. This is, uh, this is Orion. Some of you know, may know the constellation in the sky, Orion, and just uh, eastward of uh, Orion, uh, is the brightest star in the sky, it's called Sirius. So Huygens took uh, Sirius and projected, I think, the image of the sun on a screen and then made a pinprick hole and then somehow compared the brightness of that hole with Sirius and by walking backwards, how big that hole was. Again, this is, I think, what he has done. He makes the statement that the sun was 27,664 times brighter than serious. And then he assumes in the next sentence that they are of the similar brightness. This is a leap of uh, 
uh, I, I should say jointly. This is the first time somebody is making a connection between sun and the fixed stars. And they're saying that you know, they have similar brightness, which it is not true. Now we know that Sirius is intrinsically more than thousand times brighter than the sun. But okay, this is a, a simple hypothesis. And you know, in science, we make a hypothesis, we go and, uh, uh, ahead and make some quantitative estimate, which is what Huygens did, which is perfectly legitimate. Then he says, if this is true, then one can estimate the distance to Sirius. It's the first time one is talking about distances to stars. Uh, and I, I think uh, Newton was impressed by this, which is why I think uh, Newton put this in the, in the footnote of the later edition of Principia. Um, as you have noticed that uh, by this time, the idea of the fixed stars have changed. Initially in the Greek uh, uh, idea, there's the fixed stars were all uh, out there somewhere in the eighth heaven. Uh, by 17th century uh, and 18th century, the stars were thought to be at different distances. And, you know, um, so the ideas have changed, by the way. Um, now, what I would, I, I, I'm, I don't want to talk about history to tell you how wrong those people were. That's not the object of my uh, talk. Uh, what I would like to do is to go through the steps in the argument um, that has led to this conclusion. Um, and I would like to invite you to uh, think of how one can go about to ascertain whether the sun is a star or not. How do you do that? So we should probably think of some physical properties of these objects, sun and the stars, measure then the, uh, uh, these physical properties and then compare whether, and then just for ourselves, whether sun uh, can be thought of as a star or not. So I suppose one would think of uh, uh, different dimensions like the length scales, the mass scales, the energy, time, etc. right? Temperature. So one can think of the size of sun and the size of the stars, the mass of the sun, mass of the stars, luminosity, which would uh, incorporate energy and time, which is basically how much energy uh, is being put forth by these objects per unit time, maybe the temperature. And if you can think of something else, you can, we, we can discuss this. Uh, I mean, this is what I can think of uh, to, to begin with. So we can uh, find the values uh, for the sun with respect to these uh, properties and compare them with those of the stars. Okay. Let's uh, begin with uh, this physical property. Let's, let's, let's say begin with the size. Now, how to measure the sizes of stars? That's a very difficult measurement indeed. Uh, to give you an idea, if I put, if we were to put the sun at a distance of the nearest star, the Proxima Centauri, the, it would subtend an angle of uh, only seven milli arc second. And that's a very, very small. I mean, if you divide in degree into 60 uh, equal parts, you get an arc minute. You divide uh, an arc minute into 60 equal parts, you get an arc second. And that's seven thousandth of that. Okay, it's a very small angle. Uh, if you, I can, let me give you an uh, analogy. Um, uh, if you were to uh, see a cricket pitch, uh, the crease to crease uh, distance from the moon, this will be of this angle. By the way, there is a very interesting article on this topic by Rajaram Nitananda in Resonance um, uh, in July 20, 2017. Since we're celebrating Resonance, I think uh, um, it will be appropriate. I thought it appropriate to refer to, uh, it's a very interesting article. You should read about it. Anyway, so why is it difficult uh, to resolve means I want to see the two ends of the star, the diametrically opposite ends, for example, clearly distinguished from one another. That's called resolving a, 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 an object. Uh, and that is difficult because of what is called diffraction. Diffraction of waves. Uh, so suppose I, uh, there is a wave coming uh, through an aperture of uh, a certain size. What will happen? It's again due to uh, a principle, due to uh, Christian Huygens, we call it Huygens principle, that 
you can think of all these points as uh, sources of secondary sources of waves. And so waves will emanate from each of these uh, points and they will interfere uh, among themselves. And as you know, if they, there is interference, uh, there will be constructive interference, there will be destructive interference. I mean, in the waves you will have peaks and troughs. So the peaks meets with peaks and troughs meets with troughs, it will be constructive, they will add up, they either uh, become double of that or, uh, right? But if the peak meets with the trough, there will be the result will be null. So at a, any given position, you will either have a bright patch or a dark patch, depending on whether there's a constructive interference or destructive interference. So the result is that in such a case, if you allow the light uh, wave uh, from a single source through an aperture, you will basically, because of this diffraction, uh, a phenomenon of diffraction, you will get a central bright uh, a source uh, 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 portion and surrounded by uh, dark and bright uh, rings okay, of varying uh, of uh, uh, brightness. Now, that's because of a single source. Now, if you now take two sources, then you will have a pattern like this. And if you want to say that, suppose I think of these two sources as being two uh, uh, diametrically, uh, uh, two ends of the diameter, uh, uh, diameter of a star, and I want to distinguish between these two points, in other words, I want to resolve the star, I want to see the star, uh, then, I sh then the angle uh, uh, is uh, comes out of diffraction, uh, is given by this, where lambda is the wavelength of the light, or whatever wave you are, uh, one is using, and theta is the angle between them, and d is the diameter, of the aperture of the instrument one is using. Then you can work out if I want to really resolve a seven milli arc second uh, angle, which of course you'll have to uh, convert into radians and then use this uh, formula. You find that you know you will have to have a telescope of a diameter about 20 meters, 18 meters or so. And that too you'll have to put it in space because on Earth, uh, the atmospheric turbulence will kill your uh, experiment. Uh, you cannot resolve uh, such small uh, angles. Uh, they will blur out the atmospheric turbulence on Earth. So you need to go out in space. And putting a, a, a telescope of you know 15 to 20 meters is like it's uh, it's it's like science fiction now, even now. So that's a very difficult um, enterprise altogether. But there is a way out. There is another way of uh, uh, measuring the sizes of stars, and that's through interference. Uh, suppose, uh, suppose we take a point sources infinity, okay, and then I have two slits here, and these are the incoming either say peaks or the troughs of the wavelength say lambda, and uh, so this is the two slit uh, uh, interference pattern. I will get uh, I'll get fringes. And suppose the baseline is uh, uh, the distance between the two slits is b, then uh, then uh, uh, the uh, the fringe width will be uh, 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 will be of the order of lambda over b. Now, if I have two sources, again you can think of two sources being basically two ends of uh, a diametrically opposite uh, 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 ends of a star. Then the second uh, uh, source, uh, this light from the source, will have a will uh, come at a different angle, and it will create its own fringe pattern, which will be superposed on this. So basically, what will happen? The fringe pattern, the bright and dark, bright and dark pattern, will get washed out because of the superposition from these two sources. And depending on how uh, the angular uh, uh, separation between these sources and the angular separation between these two slits you will either get fringe or not get fringe, right? And then you can actually work out to find out the, uh, determine the uh, size of a star. And back in 1920s, for, uh, uh, for the largest star, it's, it's a large star, uh, Betelgeuse, it's also in um, Orion, the, the red star. And it's a uh, it's a nearby star, and so it's also a large star. So the angle subtended was uh, eighty milli arc second. It's like ten times more than 
the number uh, for the sun at uh, Proxima Centauri's distance. Uh, so that was done. And so this is possible, but it's so difficult. It only can be done for nearby stars, for large stars. Um, there's another way though, uh, which is uh, pretty cool. Uh, you can, uh, when a star gets occulted by the moon, say, for example, suppose there's a star here and this is the moon, right? Uh, and the moon, of course, moves across the sky and uh, it's going to, it, it may uh, occult this uh, uh, star uh, at certain point. And since we know the position and the movement of the moon very, very accurately in the sky, in principle, one can measure uh, by the decrement of light. As, as, at this point, you will see the light uh, from the star and this point you will not. And so the, by the time it's taken, you can, in principle, determine the size. But again, this is not so easy at uh, this scene. Uh, there is also going to be some diffraction here, which uh, happens, uh, uh, as we say, uh, diffraction at a straight edge. Suppose you have a source here, and, and I have an opaque object here, okay? Which is, so it's, uh, uh, the half of it is, uh, uh, so, is hidden. And so in the screen uh, at a distance, what you'll see, it's not just uh, dark and bright. Uh, it's not going to be just dark and bright uh, uh, portions. There will be fringes here also. And that's again due to diffraction. And so when the moon, you can think of the moon like uh, uh, the opaque object here, which is slowly uh, uh, covering this uh, background star. Uh, as it does, you'll also see fringe pattern. And then it's going to uh, as when the star is completely hidden, it will, the, the intensity, this is the intensity versus time uh, plot for several stars. Uh, but in principle, this is also possible. But again, for only uh, nearby stars, which are large enough. And to this day, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, only a hundred odd stars have been uh, yeah, measured, uh, the, the sizes have been measured. So this is a very recent kind of phenomena. People in 19th century didn't have access to all this. Okay. So let's talk about uh, the other properties. Uh, the mass. How do you measure the mass of the sun? Which now you know from your school uh, physics. Uh, if we want to measure the mass of any object in space, we have to consider the gravitational interaction that the object has on a companion, on another object. Um, so for the sun, for example, the planets uh, are a very handy uh, um, companions so that you can use here for this calculation. So for the, for example, if you take the motion of the earth around the sun, um, you can, it's a circular motion, suppose it's, uh, uh, you can think of the eccentricity being very small, so it's more or less circular. Uh, and then you can, then there will be a centripetal acceleration, which you will then equate with the, the gravitational interaction that you know from uh, Newton's law. And equating this too, we can, uh, we can, uh, and the small m, the, the mass of the earth uh, cancels out. Uh, well, this is a test particle case, test particle in the sense the, 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 ma, uh, the, the gravitational attraction uh, of the sun due to the earth is very, very small. And so this, uh, the center of mass is really very close to the center of the sun. So uh, in that sense, it's uh, the mass of the earth is a test particle. So it cancels out and then you get the mass of the sun, uh, which depends on two things, the speed of rotation uh, of the companion around the uh, object that you're, whose mass you are measuring and the distance, the size of the orbit. Okay, and that turns out to be uh, uh, 10 to about 30 kg or so. How do you then measure the mass of the sun, uh, the stars? Well, a similar idea. Uh, otherwise, I mean, the, the, uh, this is the only way you can measure the mass of uh, any object, really. Uh, 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 and, and it turns out that luckily for us, more than half the stars have companions. 
some have two companions, some have one companion. So they're binary systems there. Some are in a very complicated uh, scenario where there are you know, two or three more companions. But suppose, uh, let's take a, a binary star system. Uh, so they're going to now revolve around, uh, you cannot really treat them as stressed particles anymore because both of them can be of uh, comparable masses. So you, can, you actually have to think of the motion around the center of mass. Right. So both of them are going to rotate around the center of mass, uh, depending on, uh, uh, on the relative masses. So the, the, but the idea is the same. You have to know the size of the orbit, size uh, which you can know from the angle it subtends, and if you uh, have some idea of the distance to this uh, system. And you have to know the speed of rotation, which you can find out from Doppler shift. Uh, I will talk about the spectrum of stars later and, and explain all this, but for the timing, just uh, let's take that. Uh, in the spectrum of stars, what you see, you see a rainbow, uh, like a continuous uh, light from red to blue and superposed on that, you also see some dark lines. I'll talk about dark lines in more detail later. Let's say there will be dark lines due to the star A. This is say star A, uh, the big star, uh, the blue star. And let's say the star B, okay? And then I'll, I'll play this video. So at, at some moment, suppose the, we are looking at from here, this is the earth. So it's uh, at, at any given moment, uh, if the star comes towards us, star A comes towards us, star B will go away from us. So, and the Doppler shift says that the, the source of light moves towards us. The light from it will, uh, the frequency will become higher. So it will move towards blue. And if it moves away from us, it will become redder. It will, its frequency will become smaller and wavelength will become increased. So, uh, so as you can, you will see that as these two stars, they uh, keep, uh, one star will come towards us, one star will go uh, away from us. These two lines will uh, suffer blue shift and red shift, blue shift and red shift. Like this, let me play it again. And this can be measured. And this is how we can know the velocity of the speed of rotation. And as I said, we can also find out the size, the orbit, size of the radius of the orbit. And then, so this is how we can find out the relative masses and sometimes uh, the total mass. Uh, of course, uh, there are uncertainties uh, we should keep in mind because in, in, in astronomy, you know, we all see everything projected on a sky plane. In other words, if uh, suppose the plane of the orbit is something like this, uh, what we see is, uh, is what is projected on the sky plane. So uh, you see a projection, not the 3D uh, separation. And also we don't, uh, you cannot measure the 3D velocity, but only one component of the velocity. That uh, introduces uncertainties in the estimate of the masses. One had to you know, keep that in mind. So this is how masses can be determined. And this is how uh, the mass of the sun compares with the masses of the stars that we know, right? In the unit of the mass of the sun, which is called the solar mass, uh, the lowest, the low mass, uh, the, 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 the stars which can have very, very low mass, but uh, of the order of say a 10% of this mass of the sun, that's like you are hitting the limit. Below that, we don't know of any star. And on the other extreme, uh, theoretically speaking, one can have 100 solar masses of stars. Uh, so you can see, you know, our, the solar mass, the mass of the sun is, uh, occupies uh, some sort of a geometric mean of the two ends of uh, the low mass stars and high mass stars, okay? So mass-wise, sun is then an average star. Okay, we can um, average mass star. Um, right. Let's talk about the third property. What about luminosity? Can we compare the luminosity of the sun with the luminosity of the stars? Now, luminosity can be determined, measured. It's a two step process. First, you have to know the distance and also the flux of radiation on Earth, right? The flux is luminosity divided by four pi r squared. So if you want to know the luminosity first, you have to measure flux, which is uh, 
energy per unit time per unit area uh, uh, on Earth, and then the distance of that object from the Earth, and that will give us the luminosity. Uh, I mean, I, we're not talking about apparent luminosity. There are two things. I mean, the stars uh, that we see in the sky can be bright or faint, but uh, a star can be actually bright, intrinsically bright, but can be very far away, so it, it may appear faint. And a star can be actually intrinsically less bright, but it may be very close to us and it will appear uh, relatively bright. So one, we are talking about the absolute, uh, the intrinsic luminosity here. Now how, for the case of the sun, then we'll have to measure these two things, the distance to the sun, and how much of solar radiation falls on Earth per unit time, per unit area per unit time. The distance to the sun, as you know, was measured uh, with the help of Venus transit. Uh, and that was uh, a big activity, a lot of campaigns uh, uh, mounted in the 18th century. Uh, this is an idea credited to Halley, um, who thought that this can be a, a it's a very simple geometrical uh, uh, calculation. So Venus being an interior planet, it uh, when it crosses uh, the disk of the sun, as we uh, as we uh, as seen from the Earth. But if you happen to observe this event, this phenomenon, from two different locations on Earth, the exact path of crossing will appear different. That was Halley's idea. Is for example, here, if you see the Venus transit from A, it will appear to have crossed like this. And if you uh, uh, observe it from B, point B, another point B, then it will appear to have crossed in a different manner. And if we then have this uh, uh, observation at hand, and if we know the size of the Earth, well, we know the radius of the Earth, that's one length scale we have to know. We also have to know the ratio of the orbit, the, the radius of the orbits of the Venus and Earth. And then you can find out simple geometry. It's like a very, very simple geometry. I, I invite you to look at, um, I think the Wikipedia page on Venus transit also has that. And I, I don't want to go through that. Uh, I just want to mention that you may wonder, well, if we didn't know the uh, distance to from the Earth to the Sun, how did you know the ratio of the orbit of Venus and Earth? Well, that's actually very easy to find out. Oh, by the way, so um, I wanted to mention that you know this was a big activity. Uh, there were two or three transits, I think, in 18th century, um, uh, and James Cook's ex expedition to Australia and New Zealand was a part of this campaign. And he observed uh, the transit of Venus from Tahiti Island, and it's called the Point Venus. Anyway, so the ratio of the uh, orbit, uh, the radius of the orbit of Venus and the Earth can be found out very simply. Um, as you know that the you know Venus is an interior orbit. Now the angle between the Sun and the Venus will have a maximum value. And the maximum value will be attained when the line joining the Earth and the Venus becomes a tangent to the orbit of the Venus, right? You can, if you think closely, you'll be able to convince yourself that that's the maximum angle. And that maximum angle can be easily, uh, we know this. Uh, if you look at the evening sky, sometimes you'll see Venus uh, and then the angle increases and then after a while, I think it's about 48, 49 degrees, and then it, it decreases. So that's a maximum angle, uh, 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 angular distance between Sun and Venus. And from that angle, you can find out the ratio of the orbit, simple geometry. Anyway, so this sort of observation led us, uh, by about 1770, we knew that the distance to the Sun uh, was uh, what the distance was. Okay. Now, it still remained to then measure the solar constant, what is called the, the, the flux of the solar radiation on Earth, how much energy falls per unit area per unit time. 
That's also not a very easy uh, measurement, by the way. Um, so when William Herschel, the discoverer of uh, Uranus, uh, he discovered infrared radiation, as you know, and realized that you know there is no visible light, but it heats up material. So since then, people have been thinking of measuring the solar radiation through heating. And this is John Herschel, this is the son of William Herschel. Uh, he continued uh, these ideas and continued to refine the instruments and the experiment. Finally, it was uh, Claude Pouillet, uh, uh, Pouillet in 1838, uh, measured the, uh, the flux to uh, some accuracy uh, with an instrument called pyrheliometer. Basically, it's, it's pointing towards the sun. It had water, a certain amount of water. And it was blackened so that you know it could absorb all uh, that was coming uh, on it, falling on it. And um, uh, so, and the uh, raise in the temperature of the water was measured after a certain time. So, amount of radiation falling on certain uh, areas per unit time could be measured. Uh, here is a, a modern version of the same instrument, pyrheliometer, which is. Uh, uh, which is what is used to measure the flux of the solar radiation or not. Uh, by the way, so uh, uh, this is on ground. You still have to make some consideration, uh, uh, consider the uh, absorption of radiation by the atmosphere, because what you're interested in, what you want is the, uh, the solar radiation falling on Earth, uh, on the atmosphere, not on ground only. So you have to make some estimates uh, of the absorption. And then you can, uh, with the flux and the distance, then you can find out the total luminosity of the sun. And this is uh, what comes up, uh, four times 10 to the power 26 joule per second, right? What about the luminosity of stars? Can we compare this with the luminosity of the stars? Uh, that's, uh, that's difficult because you cannot think of uh, uh, putting water and then letting so, uh, light from the stars to fall on it and, 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 and raise its temperature, heating it up. That's just too tiny amount of radiation falling on it. How to do that? That, um, now, astronomers had a system of uh, describing the brightnesses of stars, but that, um, going back to the Greek time, this is Hipparchus system of, uh, uh, we call it magnitude of stars. And it's roughly logarithmic because our eyes sense brightness in a logarithmic manner. And uh, so the dimmest star visible to the naked eye was of uh, called the sixth magnitude. And uh, brighter stars had smaller magnitude. So for example, in this little dipper, Polaris uh, would have, a mag it would be of a magnitude two star and relatively fainter star will have a, a higher, uh, larger value, four, et cetera, five. But this is again, is to do with relative brightnesses. This system was, by the way, uh, refined in 1830s, 40s, uh, um, in the first half of uh, 19th century by uh, Norman Pogson, and uh, uh, a proper mathematical uh, expression was given. Um, um, and uh, by 1860, uh, astronomers started photographing so that, that they had a method of measuring the magnitudes of the brightnesses by finding out the, how big the dark area, the, the, the patch uh, on a photographic plate uh, each star made. But this is again, relative brightnesses. Oh, by the way, incidentally, Norman Pogson was the government astronomer in Madras Observatory in India. Um, and he, he, he was buried in Chennai. Chennai. Um, his tombstone is still there. So, but there's still the relative brightness is two stars. How do you compare the brightness of the sun to another star or uh, that of a standard candle? That's dif difficult. It's like comparing the uh, putting an elephant on an, or an ant on the same scale. Uh, you cannot do that, right? Uh, now, in 1857, as the year of our CEPO mutiny, by the way, the Austrian Imperial Academy announced a competition for building an instrument for stellar photometry to measure the brightness of the star. And the student in Basel in, in Switzerland, Friedrich Zollner, he devised, he came up with an instrument, the photometer, and that revolutionized astronomy. 
uh, in about a few years, in eight, by 1862, he could measure the flux of radiation from 200 odd stars. So what he did, this is the instrument. Uh, so uh, here, uh, the telescope is looking at the star, and there is a standard source uh, that he created in the laboratory. And with the system of tubes and lenses, uh, he basically diminished the, uh, the, the intensity of that light and put them on the same footing and then compared. Uh, by uh, 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 tuning, and, but he knew how to work backwards, right? So he would be able to find out how much the, the how to compare the brightness of the star with the standard candle. It's like uh, if, I, of course, I cannot put uh, an elephant on an ant uh, or Himalaya an ant on the same scale, but I can, I can, I can, I, I, I can. I, I can divide the Himalayas into equal parts and then put some equal parts with the, and then they compare the, with, the, with an end. Uh, and I would know how many times I have uh, divided uh, the Himalayas into, so I can work backwards. And that's what basically the essence of uh, his instrument was. Professor um, Nath, by, yes. Would it be okay to interrupt you to ask yes, questions? Yes, please. Okay, so there's a question from Venkatesh Jha in the audience. He asks you, Sir, when we say luminosity, is it the average luminosity over day or the maximum? Oh, um, okay. So you are probably thinking of a variable star. I'm not going to. Uh, so let's talk about uh, stars which are not variable, whose luminosity is fairly. Mm, sir, like, uh, uh, means the luminosity would. Uh, sir, is it okay to interrupt? Like, I'm in yes. Uh, sir, like the luminosity means, won't it depend on from which position we are measuring, what time of day, uh, night we are measuring, because the angles would change. Oh, maybe. oh, oh right, right. But that would be the, the because of the extinction due to atmosphere. Yes. Yes. So, so yeah, it, it, it would be, so the, it will suffer a lot of extinction due to atmosphere if you are looking uh, close to the horizon. And uh, so at the least extinction, if you were looking at the zenith, right uh, overhead. Yes, sir. Yes, I agree with that. So uh, you would actually try to do this experiment when the stars are right overhead and not uh, far out in the, uh, into the horizon. You can also, so th that also can be done. Okay, so so like I was asking like there must be a set pattern, set measure that at this point we measure the luminosity because if one star we will measure it overhead and one another star we will measure it like uh, means at far away then they'll they, we can't compare both of them they are not yes yeah. so depending on the elevation or the altitude uh, uh, we know how uh, you can actually work it out it's a very simple thing we know the atmosphere and how uh, so you can actually work out how it will vary the 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 uh, the brightness of the star as okay. it uh, uh, goes from the zenith to the uh, so you can actually work out so if you can give me the angle i'll be able to work it out okay so and so also i have one more question yeah uh, means when you were saying about the that angle uh, means that we couldn't resolve that was very small angle uh -huh. yeah. so after that uh, you said that if there are two two points so two sources yeah. and the standing waves are coming so there is some difference in those standing. There is some difference of angle in those standing it's waves. Not standing waves. These, these are the waves that are coming. So, so the waves. plane waves. The plane waves. Yes. yes. Uh, I, I missed up. Yes. Um, the plane waves they are coming. There must be some angle difference in the two plane waves by two stars at infinite distance. Yeah. So, sir, if we can't measure the angle of between the both the stars, then how can we measure the angular difference of the both the plane waves? So that's the point. Oh, no. So. Uh, I was trying to make the point, what is the, when can we actually measure the angle? And that is by, by the disappearance and appearance of fringe. The fringes will disappear if the angle has a certain uh, relation with the slit width, the, the, the distance between the two slits. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So going back to Zollner. By about 1862, he uh, ma uh, managed to compare the brightness of the sun with that of Capella, which is a bright star in the sky. Now, of course, one has to also measure the distance to Capella uh, or, or any star. Uh, and, and, and luckily, this was done by 1838. Friedrich Bessel had uh, 
make the first measurement of distances of stars using parallax, which you all know, I suppose. Uh, uh, but let me spend a couple of minutes anyway. Uh, so the idea is that uh, uh, if uh, the stars are at different distances, right? So if you if we take a say, relatively nearby star and uh, look at it uh, from say uh, from Earth uh, and, and two uh, six months apart, say January and June, then we will see the star in the background of the uh, more distant stars. We will see that they will appear to move in the uh, in the background of the uh, more distant stars. That's that's the uh, phenomenon of parallax, and we see this uh, uh, in day to day life. If you extend your uh, arm and put your thumb and look at some uh, distant object, uh, first with say your left eye and then with your right eye, you blink, and then you'll, uh, you see that your thumb has appeared to shift with respect to the background object, and that angle depends on two things. One is the distance to the thumb and the distance between the two uh, positions that I have uh, seen, the distance between the two eyes. And in the case of parallax, it will depend on the distance to the star and the, the, the baseline or the, the, the two uh, positions of that Earth. Right? And this is known uh, now that you know, the distance to the sun was known by 1770, one could actually go ahead and measure the distances of stars. And that was done. Uh, Sorry, Professor Nath. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, we are seeing a warning that your Mac will sleep soon unless it's plugged into a power. Yes. Operation. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just take a moment to just yeah. plug it into. I yeah, thought you might not be seeing it. Thank you. Yeah, the message okay. is on. Yeah. So, so basically then, so this is Bessel. And uh, if you go, if you study physics and, or maths in uh, college, you will hear more about Bessel, uh, Bessel function, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which is uh, plotted in this stamp. Now, basically the idea is that, you know, if you have a nearby star at a certain distance and, and uh, if we observe the star from two different locations in the Earth's orbit around the sun, it will uh, then there will be a parallax angle, and we then define a distance, uh, the unit of distance called one parsec. Uh, when a, a star produces a parallax of one arc second, okay, and this is the, the unit of distance. At any rate, uh, Bessel managed to uh, find the distance to the first star that he, uh, this is the first measurement of a stellar distance in 1838, and Kepler's distance was known, and so one could then compare the luminosities of the sun and the stars. And here is what we know now in the units of solar luminosity and the units of solar mass. If I put the measurements of the sun and the other stars, uh, the luminosities and the masses, this is what it looks like. So sun is here, yeah? sun is here. This is, uh, uh, it's, uh, one solar unit, one solar unit here. It's a, it's a logarithmic plot. And so, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in mass wise, it's like, uh, uh, you know, 10% is like you're hitting the lower uh, limit and uh, theoretically 100 times, but uh, it's about, you know, 60 or 70, 50, 60 times the mass of the sun uh, is the highest mass stars and the luminosity goes this way. If you have noticed that you know this is a very interesting straight line, there's a very highly correlated. Uh, uh, that's a different story altogether. That's the that's astrophysics. I mean, you are asking uh, since it's a logarithmic plot, uh, this will mean that mass and luminosities are related in a power law fashion. Um, anyway, we'll not go towards it. That this, that's uh, that's really asking about what makes the stars uh, shine the way they, they do. So let's talk about the last uh, 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 parameter I mentioned, temperature, right? Now the spectrum of the sun, we know that it, it shows a peak in the yellow or green, and that's why the sun looks yellow. Um, and, and it has a relation with the temperature. 
and it was Kirchhoff and Bunsen. Uh, in 1859, they came up with ideas to connect the, uh, the absorption and emission of radiation by objects, which led to a theoretical idea of a perfect absorber and emitter, which we call black body. And black body radiation uh, depends only on temperature. And actually, the quest to understand uh, the black body radiation led to quantum mechanics. And we will not uh, do that here. Uh, I'll just tell you this, that the black body temperature, so uh, this radiation from a black body uh, depends on its temperature. This is, uh, this is how it would, uh, this is the intensity and its wavelength, so wavelength increasing this way. So this is blue and this is red. And so uh, uh, a very high temperature object uh, and it's a low temperature object, and this is how the radiation would uh, show, uh, show uh, differ. Okay, this is uh, we came to know. One learns this uh, in for black body, and it turns out that the spectrum of the sun is pretty close to a black body. Uh, there are some uh, deviations. I'll talk about that, but more or less, this is this is the black body. The, the gray uh, is uh, is uh, is, a, is, a, is a black body spectrum. And uh, from this, one can find out the, roughly the temperature of the sun. I mean, one is talking about the temperature of the outer layer of the sun, where the uh, light that we see comes from. Um, I'll say something more about this. Well, Kirchhoff and Bunsen at that time, they were actually working on identification of elements through spectrum. I mean, you know, the, uh, the, the, the color test, you must have done this in the chemistry lab. Right, you, um, you identify elements uh, by the color it produces, the, the, the flame produces when you burn that element in a flame, Bunsen burner, right? And that's, and, and that's what happens when you, uh, you, know, you combine a theoretical genius like Kirchhoff and Bunsen and let them work out and then uh, they, they create a, a whole new subject. So what they did, what they've realized is that um, when you, uh, you are heating, you are looking at the flame when you are burning an element, you are basically uh, heating the element. And if you, well, color is a very subjective uh, thing. I mean, to be more objective, you have to look at the spectrum, right? So when you look at the spectrum, you let the uh, light pass through a prism and then you look at the spectrum, you see uh, certain bright lines, okay? And they realized that different elements had different set of lines. It was like a fingerprint, the signature uh, set of uh, series of lines. And they started identifying elements with the help of the spectrum. They also realized something that when you allow the a light uh, source of light, which has a continuous spectrum uh, from blue to red, and you allow this light to pass through a gas, which is not heated up, which is relatively cold, right? Then this cloud, this gas will absorb light of exactly the same frequencies at which it would have emitted light of its own when it heated up. This was a, a tremendous uh, discovery. This is 1859. Um, and so Kirchhoff, uh, I, I, and, and they realized that no, well, the solar spectrum did show dark lines. This was known from the beginning of 19th century, discovered by Fraunhofer, and then they're known as Fraunhofer lines. And this remained a mysterious, these, uh, the origin of these dark lines. And with Kirchhoff's ideas, uh, one could then understand. Uh, uh, the, the story goes something like this. One uh, evening, I think they were sitting in their uh, uh, lab uh, in, in Munich, and there was a forest fire about 10 miles away uh, in Mannheim. And they, they, they looked at uh, the forest fire through the telescope and the prism, and they could identify the elements that were burning in the forest fire. And they said, well, if we could do this to the light that is coming from 10 kilometers for 10 miles from here, why couldn't we do the same thing for the sun, right? You can identify elements in the sun by looking at the spectrum. The Kirchhoff's idea was this, that if you, there's a light source, if there is no obstruction, then it would it creates a spectrum like this. And if, if, if it goes through a relatively cooler gas cloud, then it is going to absorb uh, and produce a dark line in the same place which the gas cloud would have emitted on its own when heated. 
So you can look at this, uh, you can do this experiment in lab and then, then compare the uh, spectrum of the sun and then look at the position of the wavelength of the dark line and compare and then identify your elements. The idea was that the core of the sun is produces light of all wavelengths. And as it passes through the outer layers, which is relatively cooler, it suffers absorption in certain wavelengths and produces these lines. And there are all kinds of elements there. And they started, uh, they could identify all kinds of elements in the sun. Um, so now one could actually talk about elements in the sun. Now, and, and, and a student of Bunsen went to England, gave a, a lecture and then, which was attended by uh, uh, an amateur astronomer, William Huggins, uh, who was a silk merchant and then he gave up his business and then uh, built an observatory in his house. And with his wife, Mary Huggins, they started observing in 1862. By the way, this is the same year that Zollner made his photometer and compared the brightnesses, calibrated the brightness of stars uh, in terms of uh, the standard candle. The same year, um, uh, William and Mary Huggins, they came up with the spec set of the first set of spectrum of stars and compared them side by side with that of the sun. This is the first time this. So, so not only that, you know, the luminosity uh, was comparable, uh, one could be compared, they were also comparing the spectrum. Um, the story doesn't really end here. Uh, at the time, so in the spectrum, there are different lines, um, and sometimes you would see some line to be prominent, and sometimes you saw the same line not to be very prominent. It was not very really clear what is the physical reason behind the. Uh, so they they grouped these stellar spectra into some arbitrary groups like A, B, C, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the physical significance was not really known, and that was explained almost exactly 100 years ago by Meghnad Saha uh, in 1920, 1921. So this is a paper that he wrote uh, on the physical theory of uh, a stellar spectrum. This is the 100 year of that. So that's why I thought I should mention this. Uh, what he did, um, let me just take an example. Uh, since uh, in the school, you have no, you know about Bohr's uh, model. Let's take the 656 uh, nanometer line of hydrogen, which is in the red. Okay, this is the hydrogen emission spectrum, by the way. Uh, so that's the red line, and uh, it's at 656. And uh, you know that there are uh, the energy levels um, of hydrogen is the first ground level, and the second level, and third level. And this line, this red line, comes about so, well, emission wise it will come about when an electron jumps from third to the second level. And dark line would appear when the electron jumps from second to the third level. Let's talk about the dark line in the stars, right? So the electron then jumps from second to the third level by absorbing a photon of an appropriate energy. Uh, what Meghnad Saha said that this line is going to be prominent only for a limited range of temperature, around 10,000 degrees. Why limited range? If the temperature is very small, temperature of the gas is very, very low, then the electron is mostly going to be in the first ground level only. It's not going to be in the second level. So there's no question of it's absorbing uh, another photon and going from second to third. So if the temperature is very low, you will not see this H alpha line, right? this 656 line. And if the temperature is very high, then the hydrogen is, atom is going to be ionized or the electron is going to be thrown out of the uh, uh, atom. Again, you will not see the, the dark line at in the red 656 nanometer. So this line is going to be prominent only for a certain range of temperature. And so, uh, and this, you can work this out for all kinds of uh, elements in all kinds of lines when at which temperature which line is going to be prominent and that's how you could explain the uh, different uh, dark lines in different spectrum of stars and basically he said that, that each spectral type is associated with the temperature so now basically that's how 
we could uh, we, we can think of we can compare the mass the size the luminosities of the stars and the and uh, with that of the sun and we can now say that in the sun has average mass luminosity etc we can also compare the abundance of elements um, which it turns out to be comparable and that's how uh, i mean th th that's how we can say that you know sun is actually really a star you see one thing that i i, I forgot to mention is that in, in when we started with this hypothesis the, whether the sun is a star and then um, started comparing different uh, properties, you can never prove that it is wrong. I, I, I prove that you can never prove that it's right, right? In science, you always falsify things. And if the hypothesis is wrong, then you can say, okay, that hypothesis doesn't work. But if the hypothesis works, it, you cannot say that, you know, well, it is the correct thing. You can only say that, well, it supports your hypothesis. So, the, my idea is to just ask a very simple question, whether the sun is a star or not, and look at uh, the, all the steps in the argument. And it has uh, given us glimpses of uh, some history of science and methodology or philosophy of science also. The, that's the essence of science. I mean, uh, don't take anything for granted. I mean, question everything. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, clap uh, for Professor Nath's nice lecture. Thank uh, you. Are there any questions? Uh, please unmute yourself and ask, I think. Uh, Uh, Professor Joseph Samuel asks, why did Zollner not win the prize? Oh, yeah, right, right. Uh, thanks for asking the question. I, I'm not very sure. Somehow I, I read the statement that the academy didn't think that uh, 226, uh, the number of stars was not enough. <laughs> it's very unfortunate. He spent about four or five years on this. <laughs> Sir, so then the one who won the prize, he must be have like he must had have done more than two twenty six. Like who won the prize then? If he no, did. nobody won the prize. No, this is prize was not given to anybody, as far as I know. Um, <laughs> but as you can imagine, this 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 uh, instrument became a part and parcel of every observatory very very uh, soon, because mm -hmm. this is the first time one can one was to calibrate, mm -hmm. and, and this is very important right i mean any any physical measurement professor bagla has a question yeah, yeah. Bhiman, i had a comment uh, yes. i think the first attempt to measure the uh, angular size of a star was made by galileo ah. and uh, what he did was he hung a string ah. and moved his telescope back and forth until ah. the star was just occulted by the string except that he did not account for uh, atmospheric turbulence and therefore he got a distance which was completely wrong oh i didn't know about this thank you i see. so this is like a crossway no, he just hung a string far away okay I and see. then he pointed his telescope uh, and positioned him so that a star would be behind the string i see uh-huh well thanks i'll look at this up Any other questions or comments? Uh, can you comment about the method for finding the distance to the moon? Uh, by, I think when you look at the half, half moon, conclude that the distance of uh, sun, moon, earth angle is 90 degrees. Well, I mean, uh, it would be 90 degrees if the sun is at an infinite distance. The deviation yeah. from 90 degrees gives you the distance to the sun with respect right. to the distance to the moon. 
Right. Would that yeah. work for Venus? Uh, the case of uh, Earth. Yes. It. Uh, it would, but uh, it won't be ninety degrees. You will have to know the. Uh, We'll see ninety degrees when when we we'll say half Venus at the tangential point when is the maximum elevation? Isn't that correct? One has to draw the triangles. Yeah. The but then you have to know the distance to the moon, which yeah. uh, people knew uh, from the observations of uh, lunar eclipse. How long does the lunar eclipse, when the uh, shadow of the Earth falls on the Moon, the Moon okay. takes a certain time, uh, why, uh, uh, to cross the, mm. the umbra, and that uh, can give you the distance to the Moon with respect to the size of the Earth, which is known. So it's like a distance ladder. One starts from one length scale and then goes to another length scale, and so uh, the starting length scale is the the radius of the earth uh, there's a question from youtube uh, from the live uh, uh, right. uh, when we see, see videos of space released by nasa we see gen we generally see all black why don't we see stars i'm not sure what that question actually means. I mean, they're all black. Is it just that there is density oh. is very low? And... Yeah. Anything I to do with exposure time? Yes, I suppose so. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. The stars are much, much fainter than the planets uh, which they are taking pictures of. And that is why this happens. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, I guess uh, if there are no more questions, or should we wait some more time for YouTube? More questions on YouTube? I think there is a question on chat. Okay, if we mark the position of Venus in the night sky every night for prolonged period and superpose them, okay, you'll get a plus eye and then. So then won't it be like a sufficient to get the radius? I mean, get the distance? Uh, the ratio of the distance, yes. Okay. Yes, okay. yes, yes, absolutely right. So at some point you will see that in the elongation has decreased, so you'll be able to find out the maximum. So like then, this, this one absolutely. may have less error than the one in the light one because light may get deflected, bent, and all that stuff. This is just we are marking the position, and trying to draw the uh, the loci. So it is it may have like it may have less error. Sure, sure, right. Okay. Yeah, you can do this experiment. So it will take long. Like it will take very very long. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. There is this, uh, uh, I think, a problem in uh, spherical trigonometry, I think. But you need to mark only three positions in, to, in the sky to get the orbit of a yeah. comet. That should yes. be for a planet also. Yeah, yeah. That, that's true. But here we are talking about something else. Yeah. That is the famous uh, Gauss's uh, calculation. And he wanted to get the orbit of Sere, uh, not Sere. Yeah, it's a big asteroid. I, I, I'm confused about the name right now. The name Ceres. Ceres is right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ceres. It's actually very cute because uh, the only assumption is that those three point, the orbit of Sere lies in a plane, and therefore. Uh, Mm -hmm. With three observations, the intermediate observation has to be in the plane defined by uh, the position vector of Sere from the sun. The first and third, they define a plane, and the second one has to be in the plane. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. 
So it was not Halley, it was Gauss, is it? No, Gauss. I see. It was Gauss. Okay. I also believe he invented this least squares method to solve mm -hmm. this particular problem. Yeah. Oh, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think uh, there are no more questions. Uh, maybe we can stop recording. And thank uh, Professor. Thank Lord you. For